Mark, thank you for the kind introduction. And so much, uh, thank you so much too to Cato for hosting uh, this event. The timing of it could not be better as we really sort of debate the direction of the country and how best both control spending and grow the economy at the same time. That's what I would like to talk about today. I'm also honored to be on a program with uh, Senators Bob Corker and Mike Lee, uh, my fellow Texan, uh, former Senator Phil Graham, and distinguished academics such as Vito Tanzi and Richard Vetter. Uh, I'd like to begin by quoting the organizer of this conference, Dan Mitchell, uh, who said, deficits and debt are the symptoms. Spending is the disease. Treat the disease and the symptoms will go away. Uh, it's important for everyone to understand the United States uh, has uh, a fiscal crisis because of excessive federal spending and that constraining the growth of federal spending is a solution. Several months ago, I asked the Republican staff of the Joint Economic Committee to sort of analyze and survey a body of uh, economic work, published economic literature, on fiscal consolidations. Fiscal consolidation is not a phrase uh, used so often in America, but uh, has in Europe and other parts of the world for quite uh, a while. And these are programs designed to reduce a government's budget deficits and stabilize the government debt as a percentage of their economy. And I asked them to study the results of such programs in other developed countries, our competitors around the world, um, over the last four decades. And the result of that analysis is a report that we re recently released called Spend Less, Owe Less, Grow the Economy, which I'd like to go through with you fairly br briefly. But before we do, and, and before I summarize the report's finding, let me show you two charts. I'm going to keep John busy today because we're getting paid by the chart. Um, we'll see how after the government shutdown that works. Um, uh, we asked the, uh, our folks to take a look at the last four decades in the United States to track government spending at the federal level versus job creation uh, along Main Street, private sector employment. As you can tell, the, the blue line is federal expenditures. The red line is job growth. Uh, what it shows is uh, over the past four decades, uh, there is no relationship between federal spending and job growth along Main Street. In fact, for each of those four decades, there's a negative correlation between them. Let's look at the next chart. We then tracked over the last uh, four, uh, 40 years um, private business investment and job creation in the private sector. And as you can tell, the blue line is private uh, uh, fixed uh, business investment. And what it shows, obviously, is a direct correlation. And, and this type of investment is very simple. It is when businesses invent, invest in new equipment, new software, new buildings. What it shows is that businesses along Main Street grow. There is no substitute for this private business investment, not stimulus, uh, not rebates, and not even shovel-ready projects are a, a substitute uh, for, um, for private business investment. And while there is great debate about the impact of stimulus, what we do know is that in the past two years, after having spent uh, over $800 billion, in America, we have two million fewer jobs than when the stimulus began. We were told if we went on that spending spree, the unemployment rate this month would be 6.8%. Uh, we are, as a nation, a wildly uh, uh, off uh, 7 million jobs in projections after the stimulus um, uh, occurred. So there is, in my belief, uh, no substitute for business investment in creating jobs and um, uh, in getting the economy going. As to the report on fiscal consolidation, uh, there's two criteria by which economists judge these fiscal consolidation programs. One, do these programs actually reduce the government budget deficits? Do they stabilize the level of what a country owes as a percentage of their economy? This is the, uh, the success criterion. And secondly, do the programs boost economic growth and job creation? This is known as the growth criterion. Um, as for the success criterion, spend less, owe less, grow less uh, provides clear and convincing evidence that if a government wants to succeed in reducing its budget deficit and stabilizing its debt, it has to restrain spending. Uh, Albert uh, Alicina and Sylvia Ardagna, both of whom are distinguished economics professors from Harvard, found 21 instances 
between 1970 and 2007, where 10 of America's international competitors successfully reduced their government debt to GDP ratio by four and a half percentage points or more, based predominantly or entirely on spending reductions. Uh, Andrew Biggs, uh, Kevin Hassett, Michael Jensen, all of whom are from AEI, found that successful f fiscal consolidations, in fact, and we may have a chart on that, John. AEI's economists, yeah, took a look at uh, these fiscal consolidation programs internationally uh, and determined that the countries that were successful in reducing their deficits and stabilizing, reducing uh, their debt, um, there was a difference between them. Countries that were successful in do that, did, doing that relied principally on spending cuts in order to do it. The countries that were unsuccessful in achieving that relied, at least in a balanced approach, on tax increases as well as spending cuts. And I should uh, point out that even within the successful programs, that 15 percent revenue increases were not from tax increases. Often they were from other non-tax sources, such as privatizing government-owned enterprises, asset sales, and user fees. So countries with successful programs on how to reduce their, their debt not only relied on spending cuts, uh, they did not increase taxes, especially marginal income tax rates or rates on business or uh, capital. While spending reductions were important uh, to, to successful budget deficit reductions, uh, spending reductions are even more important for achieving the growth criteria, for getting the economy moving. Uh, for example, John. Neighboring Canada uh, shrank its total government spending by 12.8 percentage points of the GDP between 1994 and 2006 and boosted its annual economic growth from under 1 percent to a pretty robust 3.4 percent average over the next 12 years. You can see the, the growth in that chart there. Sweden, their economy was actually shrinking. Uh, in the early 1990s, after reducing its government spending by over 11 percentage points of GDP, Sweden's negative growth economy revived to an average of 3.5% uh, over see, about a 10-year uh, period. Uh, New Zealand did the same. New De Zealand did the same, fairly robust economy. Uh, deficits in spending grew. They, uh, they um, uh, readjusted uh, their spending and revived uh, a f fairly strong economic growth. In uh, in one point uh, I want to make: these countries, uh, Sweden, Canada, New Zealand, uh, they're not alone. Uh, Alicina and Ardagna found 26 episodes in nine developed countries, countries with developed economies like ours, where reducing government budget deficits in debt through spending cuts provided a large boost to their economic growth in the first three years after they began their fiscal consolidation. In fact, the average growth for those countries was not a minor increase in economic growth. They shot the top quarter of developed countries in economic growth. So uh, spending cuts translated to economic growth. That's perhaps uh, the most important finding uh, of the report. Uh, as you know, while most economists agree countries that reduce their deficits and debt boost their economic growth over the long term, what this report shows is analyzing these economic studies, reducing federal spending can boost economic growth and job creation in the short term uh, as well. And the reason, I think, is fairly common sense, as these studies show. Uh, what happened was businesses uh, no longer expected the government to levy large tax increases in the future uh, to pay for excessive spending, so private business investment grew. They invested in the buildings, equipment, software, and as we know, that jobs, uh, drives job uh, creation. Uh, secondly, households also recognizing that they would have more permanent disposable income in the future without facing those higher tax increases felt comfortable in their spending and they began buying larger ticket items such as homes uh, and automobiles. And um, a point I would like to make because it raised itself immediately is so what type of spending cuts create this type of growth? 
one key point, not all spending cuts are the same when it comes to job creation. What these uh, economic studies showed that if you want to grow the uh, jobs in the short term and job creation to maximize it, the spending reductions must be large, credible, and difficult to reverse. Spending cuts must be large, credible, and difficult to reverse once made. The savings that produce the greatest economic growth uh, include right-sizing the government workforce, um, and its uh, compensation, eliminating duplicative programs and agencies, eliminating subsidies to businesses, and reforming and reducing transfer payments to individuals. So they're right-sized like a business, right-sized their workforce, eliminated, eliminated the programs that duplicate and waste money. They eliminated the subsidies to businesses and reformed their entitlements. And in the area of entitlements, what I thought was interesting was the study found the evidence of strong economic growth uh, from reforming the government pension and health care plans to make them sustainable and solvent. Even when the reforms were phased in over time, and didn't affect existing beneficiaries. So programs that tackled entitlements in a credible way, even if they didn't touch those on it today and phased in those reforms, had the effect of growing the economy or helping boost the economy in the short term. Our point uh, is that ample real life data pr proves there are significant economic growth and job creation benefits that accrue from reducing spending and reforming entitle entitlement programs restore their sustainability for future generations. Earlier this week, uh, the budget chairman, Paul Ryan, unveiled his path to prosperity, um, uh, unveiled it uh, Tuesday. Uh, it clearly meets the test, um, the spending reduction test that must be large, credible, and difficult to reverse once made to boost economic growth. Uh, Congressman Ryan's budget tackles the medical entitlements that are driving federal spending higher. Uh, it attacks corporate welfare by phasing out government guarantees to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, eliminates subsidies for green energy, and reduces ag subsidies by $30 billion over 10 years. His budget rolls back non-security discretionary spending to its 2008 level and then freezes it for five years. Uh, part of that freeze includes adopting a number of the recommendations from the President's uh, Fiscal uh, uh, Commission to eliminate waste and achieve real savings, for example, by reducing non-defense federal auto fleets by 20 percent and selling surplus real estate. Uh, uh, Congressman Ryan's budget eliminates agencies and programs identified by the GAO recently as wasteful and duplicative. That alone saves nearly $100 billion over the decade. And Chairman Ryan's budget reduces the federal workforce by 10 percent gradually for the next five years, mainly through attrition, by hiring only one new federal employee for every three who leaves or retires. Uh, Chairman Ryan's budget uh, freezes federal pay through 2015, and together those proposals save about $375 billion over the next 10 years. Moreover, uh, Congressman Ryan's budget envisions a pro-growth tax reform that lowers the top income tax rate for both individuals and corporations to 25 percent. So in summary, uh, Congressman Ryan's budget is a fiscal consolidation plan that would grow the economy. Um, as I conclude, I, one measure of this report's uh, influence is that Dr. Paul Krugman has repeatedly attacked it in his blog and in his column in the New York Times, I always like to think if he's attacking me, I'm on the right track. Um, uh, Dr. Krugman, uh, yeah, well, he, he claimed the authors of this report were clearly aware that the evidence no longer supports their position, that restraining government spending can boost private business investment, economic growth, and job creation, because, quote, they added weasel words to cover themselves. They added weasel words to cover themselves like confidence effects can boost GDP growth rather than will boost GDP growth. Uh, and I, I can't help but thinking, surely Dr. Krugman understands the benefits from good economic policies can be overwhelmed uh, by external events in the short term. For example, our economy uh, after 9-11 affected by that, the Australian New Zealand economies slowed by the Asian financial crisis of the late 90s, uh, so uh, the weasel words to which Dr. Krugman refers um, uh, recognizes that reality. 
and in fact the studies were so diverse and so varied and eliminated a number of those external factors as it went about its uh, work that just the sheer number of these studies and the credibility of the economists that did it should provide to us in America as we look at our future path, which direction to go, should give us great confidence that cutting federal spending will not only help resolve our nation's fiscal problems, but also help American families by boosting economic growth and job creation. In closing, uh, I'd like to add a, an observation about the United States. Uh, many uh, of our Democratic friends on Capitol Hill are very fond of uh, identifying the uh, the late 1990s is a period of rapid uh, job growth in America. What is often left out of that discussion is that the size of the federal government relative to the economy shrank during that period. From fiscal year 1992 to 2001, federal outlays declined by just under 4% of our economy, from 22% roughly to 18.2%. The civilian workforce also shrank from a, a little over 2.3 million to under 2 uh, uh, million, a 10% reduction at the time. And so those today who say any cut in the federal government will damage the economy I can probably look just to a decade or so ago to see that that is not necessarily the case. In fact, uh, in this re uh, recovery, with $2 trillion of, of capital sitting on the sidelines, it's critical for us to restore the confidence for business investors to allow that capital to flow back into our economy to create the jobs that, in fact, uh, we are so long overdue in pursuing. Uh, so far, President Obama, I think, has stressed the risk of reducing America's deficits and debts right now, but he ignores the risk of delay. Uh, for America's economic future, it really is time to spend less and owe less. Uh, that is the lesson of our international competitors. Uh, it's a lesson we ought to e uh, heed as a nation. So, Mr. Perry, with that, uh, I'd be happy to stop and take some questions at this time. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, we've got about five minutes for a couple questions. Um, back there, in the in the row, right back there, yeah. Uh, I'm Mary Chris McGowan. Thank you for taking my question. I had a question from even from the beginning. Uh, we have been talking about lowering spending, and I really believe that we should do that. And we quoted uh, going down to 22 percent or 19 percent, even better, for, as a percentage of GDP. But I didn't hear anything of what would be the minimum percentage of revenues as percentage of GDP to accomplish our goals. Uh, you have a graph with a 15% there, but I don't see any kind of a study for our economy right now. Thank you. You know, there have been a number of, uh, of studies done on what is the optimal size of government that actually encourages the optimal size of the economy. Uh, those figures range normally in the 175 to 18% range. Historically, our revenue has been in around about 19% or so percent historically in the United States. And interestingly enough, no matter what Washington does to adjust the interest rates up or the tax rates up or down, the same amount of revenue tends to come in. People and businesses adjust their behavior to go with higher tax rates. So the revenues that are always projected to come in usually fall short. My view is that optimal uh, size of government ought to be somewhere in that 18 percent range. Um, and we ought to, um, even with a, an aging workforce, I think, or an aging population, I think that's possible. Uh, uh, Congressman Ryan's budget, if you've looked at the long term, comes very close to those levels, goes to and below uh, our uh, national average uh, over time. What are your thoughts? Are, do you think that that goal of that range is, uh, is an appropriate one? Really, I, I don't think revenue is a variable as relevant as spending. I really believe that. I think that spending has the second connotation of uh, helping with economic growth. So it doesn't matter really if revenue falls below, let's say, 18%. That's my personal opinion. Because the spending, lower spending, that you create economic growth, and that will compensate for any losses or potential losses of 1% or 2% in revenues. That's what I think. Right. Thank you. Yeah, right behind, uh, right there. Rick, um, 
Are there any major tax breaks that, for, that ship jobs overseas? And what's your view on the uh, currency devaluation in China? You know, um, I think we have a uh, terrible tax code for competing and winning overseas. Um, we are uh, one of the few uh, competitive countries with a, uh, a worldwide taxing system. Uh, we, um, just a few years ago, that puts us at a competitive disadvantage in a major way. We are, in effect, double taxed uh, in many of our instances. Why, it's why we have a very complicated corporate tax code to try to deal with that. But it fails, you know, I think, in making us competitive also. Uh, our competitors have ripped a page from our playbook on lower corporate taxes, where we once led our OECD um, colleagues by a pretty healthy point. We now trail them in the corporate tax uh, rates by a pretty healthy amount. Um, and so I think it's critical that we uh, reform our tax code, especially uh, in international tax uh, area. Congressman uh, Dave Camp, Chairman of the Ways and Means, has made that a priority for his committee. You're going to see uh, over the balance of this year a number of hearings held where we uh, identify where we, what the consequences of um, uh, of that tax code, what that consequences are, and how we uh, deal with it. So, yeah. Oh, on currency, um, I think it uh, it grants China a competitive advantage, but it is not the silver bullet I think many make it out to be. As chairman of the Trade Subcommittee, um, and there's no question uh, that uh, uh, the, the Chinese currency needs to appreciate over time. We're going to continue to keep pressure on them and to work with the administration to continue to pressure them as well. On the Trade Subcommittee, though, I can tell you that uh, we're no longer going to look at China just through a currency vacuum. We think there are a number of issues that, uh, that impede our ability to uh, sell our goods and services into China from uh, indigenous, indigenous innovation, directed subsidies, lending, uh, the restrictions on uh, rare earth uh, minerals, uh, all of uh, which are pretty effective non-tariff barriers to the U.S. Uh, we're also not only going to push them to become a responsible stakeholder uh, in the global trading system, but we're uh, urging the White House to, to restart uh, negotiations on a bilateral investment treaty, uh, which were stopped. Uh, we think that's important to provide our uh, investors protections overseas in the Chinese market. So bottom line is the currency currency is China currency issue is important, but it is not the only important issue in dealing with that relationship. One more? Hi, Senator. We have time for one more? Okay. Oh, okay, down in the front row? Sorry, I didn't see you. We keep hearing all the time about a 14 point three trillion dollar uh, national debt but what about the actual national debt when we include what they have taken out of the social security trust fund and misappropriated so that we will have to collect that tax again i've been drawing that tax for 27 years because i'm 91 years old well, I've taken out one hell of a lot more than I put in. The system has got to be changed. I have two great-grandchildren in college, and, well... Can I take you to Capitol Hill for just a minute? Uh, and march you around the country, um, be because you get it. Uh, those unfunded liabilities, obviously unsustainable, they're, and they're almost too big uh, to imagine uh, in cost. Uh, that's why I think... Uh, Somewhere out of this place, he told that that debt is or something in the order of $15.3 yeah. which is would make our national debt twice what they keep coming over the system. Yes, sir. Um, I'm proud of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Paul Ryan's budget. It is an adult conversation on our entitlements, uh, on Medicare and Medicaid especially, and sets the table for, uh, for uh, uh, Social Security reform as well. We can't, I, we have more charts to show you, but you've heard it from others, you'll hear it from Senator Graham as well, uh, that uh, we can't keep ignoring. 
these entitlements. One, to ignore them at all uh, uh, threatens them by themselves, but, but setting up a new system for those who are 54 and younger uh, to uh, make those programs sustainable. We can't keep putting that uh, uh, off. I was disappointed it wasn't in the President's budget, that there's been no real proposal anywhere on Capitol Hill from our colleagues across the aisle, but now's the time to move on those. And, uh, and Paul Ryan has laid out, I think, some awfully solid, sound approaches to do it. Thank you uh, very much for having me here today. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Senator Graham's uh, um, uh, comments as well. Uh, he uh, was key to me um, running for and serving uh, in Congress and uh, still uh, one of the brightest minds around. I really appreciate Cato's uh, leadership on uh, fiscal responsibility in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Grady. All right. All right. Thank you very much. All right.